So, uh, well, uh, I'd like to thank the organizers for, for the invitation first. Uh, so, indeed, what I'm going to talk about today is, uh, is about, uh, I'm going to talk about random matrix theory and show you how random matrix theory can be used to better understand how many classical machine learning algorithms work. And essentially, the bottom line message, the, the, the takeaway message of this talk is that, as you will see, when we we'll deal with large and, and actually even not so large dimensional data, many classical machine learning algorithms tend to behave very, very differently from classical intuitions. And we'll see that random matrix theory can explain why. And we will see in, through a few examples that there are many methods that tend to completely collapse when you go large dimensional. They behave very differently. And we will see it through, class, through examples that the behavior that we observe is, uh, is very opposed to classical intuition, but random matrix theory can understand that and can help improving on those algorithms. So uh, since you're not all uh, familiar with random matrix theory, I, I believe, I'll give you the, the basics of the theory that we will need to understand what happens when you deal with large dimensional data. So random matrix theory starts with a basic observation uh, so a motivation on, on uh, sample covariance matrices. Say simply you have a few observations, so, so here we're talking statistics. You have observations yi, y1, yn that live in R to the p, and say for, for simplicity that they are Gaussian id with zero mean covariance c, and that your objective is to estimate the covariance matrix c, then uh, obviously what you want to do is compute, if you want to estimate this C based on the samples, the first thing you want to do is compute the sample covariance matrix CP hat, which is nothing but the sum of those outer products, because we know, that, and that by the way we can recast at this, as this uh, matrix product, this gram matrix, and we want to do this for a simple reason, which is that through the, because of the law of large numbers, the strong law of large numbers, CP hat converges almost surely to CP when you have a lot of data, when n goes to infinity. So we all know this. Uh, and so in particular, for any uh, matrix norm, the difference between those two objects tends to zero as n goes to infinity. Well, random matrix theory starts with the observation that what I call n uh, going to infinity is actually more than just n is much greater than 1. It's, it actually means that n must be much greater than p, p the dimension of the samples. Uh, why? Because if you instead ask for p and n to go to infinity together in such a way that p is of the same order of magnitude as n, which for us is like p over n goes to a constant c that is not 0, then this is not true anymore. Cp hat does not converge, at least in, in a, a spectral norm, to Cp. And the question you may ask is, if CP hat does not go to CP, where does it go? And, and actually, the bad news is that it doesn't go anywhere. If you, if you build two times a CP like this, CP hat like this, they, they're going to look very different. In spectral norm, they will be uh, very distant. Uh, and it turns out that even for n uh, not so, like even for n larger than 100 times P, you will see that this behavior is, is, is uh, this convergence is not true. But, uh, I'm, I'm not going to uh, stay too long on this. Uh, so we cannot say much about CP hat itself, but we can say a lot of things about its spectral properties, in particular about its eigenvalues. So one of the things, and that's how uh, random matrix theory started uh, back in the uh, 70s, um, we can, s we can uh, specify what the eigenvalue distribution of CP hat will do. So here what I do is I plot an histogram of the eigenvalues of CP hat, when n is, uh, well, when small n is 4 times p, so these are the eigenvalues, well, okay, they are, they are what they are, but when you increase the size of p and n together, proportionally, like now I'm moving to 100, 400, 250, 1,000, uh, 500, 2,000, you see that there's a, a natural picture that, that, uh, uh, that starts to, to kick in, which is, which has been proved in 67, uh, by Marchenko and Pasteur to, uh, so it has been proved that this eigenvalue distribution converges to a smooth distribution that's called the marchenko pasteur law. So here, this is in the case where the population covariance is the identity. So what you would expect naturally is that all of the eigenvalues of CP hat are very close to the eigenvalues of the identity, that is one, 
So all the eigenvalues are expected to be close to 1. Well, that's not true. What happens is that the eigenvalues tend to spread. And they spread in a way that we know exactly. So um, there's a theorem for that. I'm, I'm going to go very quickly on this. We know that in the, regime, in the uh, setting I'm considering, which is when you have an X with ID, zero mean unique variance entries of size P times N, and you ask for P and N to be of the same order of magnitude, then the eigenvalue distribution of this matrix, which is my sample covariance matrix from before, converges when n and p goes to infinity to a law that has a density. And this density has a, has a, has a uh, formal characterization. But also it has a support that is in between 1 minus square root c square and 1 plus square root c square, where c is this p over n ratio. So you see that as c goes to 0, which is when I have a lot, a lot of samples compared to the size of the data, this all shrinks back to 1, which is what you would expect. But on the opposite, when c increases, when you have uh, not enough data, or when the size of each data is very large, then you have a spreading of the eigenvalues. Okay, so that's one first message. And uh, th this, is, this is a typical picture of the Martian Copastor distribution for p uh, over n equals 1 tenth. If you go one-fifth, one, one-half, the eigenvalues tend really, really to spread. Okay, that's one thing. So you expect all the eigenvalues to be equal to one. Well, in reality, that's not true. They, they tend to spread. Okay, so why do we care? We care because uh, we still try to estimate the, sample cover the population covariance metrics. And so the question is, uh, okay, we, the eigenvalues are not well estimated. What happens uh, to the eigenvectors? Uh, so first thing. Uh, assume that now I have a structure in my covariance matrix, so uh, estimating the identity is not interesting. So say you, you have a structure. So uh, CP is the identity plus some, some information carried in a low rank matrix P. So say you want to do PCA and the information is inside this P, you want to retrieve P. Then you use the sample covariance matrix, what happens? What happens is that first if you look at the eigenvalues of this matrix, then we have the same picture as before. That is, most of the eigenvalues tend to concentrate in this bulk of uh, the martian copastor distribution. But because of this perturbation, you may or may not have a few eigenvalues that, that are uh, seen outside of this main support of the martian copastor distribution. So what I'm saying here is that when P, uh, which is my low rank matrix, has a few eigenvalues that are sufficiently large, what's going to happen is that in the sample covariance matrix, in CP hat, a few eigenvalues will be seen away from the main ones, away from the noise ones, let's say. So here it's an example where the true population eigenvalues are all equal to 1, but for the last four, which are equal to 2, 3, 4, 5. And you see that indeed we have four eigenvalues for CP hat getting outside of the support. They are not equal to three, 2, 3, 4, 5. They are a bit different, but still uh, they are seen outside. Uh, this is for p over n equals 1 over 4. Now let's say I increase the size of p, or, or equivalently I decrease the size of n. Uh, then now we only see three eigenvalues. Okay, this is for uh, p over n equals 1 half. If I continue going like this, p over n equals 1, now we see only two eigenvalues outside of the support. Okay, so there's this phenomenon, if I keep increasing, I, I, I'm going to see less and less. There is this phenomenon that in random matrix theory we, we call uh, a phase transition that is such that after a certain ratio p over n, you may not be capable any longer to see some of those eigenvalues. Okay, so you, somehow you lose information. And actually, if you were to cover all of the eigenvalues, what you would see is a, is a spectrum equivalent to the one you would have if you had no information at all. So now the question would be, uh, is, is there information in my, in my data or not? Uh, is there some correlation? Well, in terms of eigenvalues, you, you may not decide. You may not be capable to decide. Uh, so this is a result. So we, we, we know how to characterize this thing actually very precisely. That is, with this covariance matrix being equal to identity plus P, and say P as eigenvalues that you're interested in that are equal to W1 to WK. So K here is not increasing with P and N. Then we know exactly how to characterize the eigenvalues of the sample covariance matrix associated. And this is here that you have this phase transition phenomenon. That is, if omega m, so the, the mth largest eigenvalue of p, 
is strictly smaller than square root of p over n, this c limiting c ratio, then asymptotically, the nth largest eigenvalue of the sample covariance matrix converges to the right edge of the support. So that is, it goes to here. It's not going to be seen outside. Okay. That's when the omega m is smaller than square root of c. If omega m is larger than square root of c, then something else happens, which is that the limit, the nth largest eigenvalue of your sample covariance matrix goes to a limit that we know exactly uh, how to characterize that is strictly greater than 1 plus square root c squared. Okay, so here you see the eigenvalue. So there's some kind of a single to noise ratio effect here. That is that if you have enough power, and enough power means more than square root of the number of, uh, of the ratio between size of the data and number of data, then you can see something, otherwise not. That's for the eigenvalues. Now where it gets more interesting is with respect to the eigenvectors, because what you want to do when you do a PCA is to, to extract the eigenvector structure. So you want to estimate P, so you want its eigenvectors. So say that P can be decomposed in spectral decomposition as a sum of omega i, ui, ui transpose, and this ui is the vector you're interested in. Then what happens is that you have exactly the same phenomenon, same phase transition. That is, if you take ui hat to be your PCA eigenvector, your the dominant eigenvector, the highest dominant eigenvector of the sample covariance matrix, then its alignment to the true u1, u high you want to estimate, so this alignment that you expect to be very close to one, well, tends actually to zero if omega i is, is smaller than square root of c. So here the phase transition phenomenon tells you that if you don't have enough signal to noise ratio, then asymptotically, the, the correlation between your observed eigenvector and the true eigenvector is zero, nothing. So you only see noise. However, beyond square root of c, you start to have something. And the correlation is also well characterized. It, is, it has a limit which is equal to this. This limit being very close to 1 when c goes to 0, meaning when n is very, very large, which is a classical regime, or when omega i is very large, which is when you have a strong uh, power in your, in your data. OK? So th that's all I want you to know about random matrix theory. Okay, there is this phase transition phenomenon. So we don't have the eigenvalues we expect. We have something broader, but they converge somewhere. And you may or may not see uh, the information you expect to see. And when you do a PCA, well, sometimes it's only pure noise. But if you exceed a certain threshold, you, ca you start to see something. And the correlation with what you expect is something we can predict. Okay. We're going to use this to predict the performance of machine learning algorithms, such as spectral clustering, exactly with the same uh, arguments, uh, but a bit more difficult. So just to show you yeah, a picture for, for this uh, thing, for this um, uh, uh, correlation, projection. Uh, OK, in red you have, so here's the, the value of the population uh, eigenvalue W1 you want to estimate, sorry, the, uh, for which you want to estimate the eigenvector. Uh, when W1 is below a certain threshold, you have an asymptotic zero alignment if you compute ui hat uh, over u high. And beyond this threshold, you have something that gets positive and all the way to 1 when omega i increases, okay, like I said. Again, this is all I want you to know to understand from random matrix theory. This is valid here for the model I just defined, which was the sample covariance matrix, something that looks like uh, an x with id entries that you uh, pre-multiply by identity plus p, which is what we have studied. But it also works for other models where you perturb uh, a, a, a covariance matrix with, uh, of, with only noise, such as this one, xx transpose plus p. So I put this one in red because we're going to meet, meet this guy uh, in the next slide. OK, so far. So this is all for random matrix theory. So let me show you uh, what happens in uh, how we use this in machine learning and why uh, this first intuition about all the eigenvalues should be equal to 1, but that's not the case in practice for real large dimensional data. How are we going to see the same behaviors appearing in machine learning? Uh, so, okay, I'll skip all that. This is all blah, blah. Uh, <laughs> so first message I want you to, to remember from this talk 
uh, is that uh, random matrix theory, so that's uh, the RMT acronym, can explain a lot of things uh, about uh, uh, collapsing behaviors of machine learning algorithms, standard machine learning algorithms, starting with SVMs, uh, when you go large dimensional, when your data are large dimensional. So let me take an example that it will, it's going to be very similar to my uh, intuition for the sample covariance matrix. Uh, say I want to cluster data, so I want to do spectral clustering. Uh, I have a Gaussian mixture model setting where uh, I have a certain number of observations x1 to xna that is a Gaussian with mean mu a and covariance ca. That's for a being between 1 and k, so I have k classes. Uh, the number of classes will remain the same for me, but the number of data n and na here in class a and the size of the data will, will be large. You will see in simulation we don't need it to be super large, in fact. Um, well, there's a the first thing to do that we don't conventionally do in machine learning uh, because now my size p of the data is increasing at the same rate as, as n, which is that since I want to do clustering the, and, and that p is increasing, since p is increasing, mu a and c a, which are p dimensional objects, are going to move <laughs> with p. So I want to ensure that when p and n grow, my problem doesn't get too easy. That is, I don't want the means and the coherences to be more and more and more different from one another when p increases. So I need to ensure what I call a non-trivial setting where uh, the distances mu a minus mu b and the distances between the, tra the, within the covariances, so here it's going to be through the trace or through the trace of the square, uh, as p grows, I don't want those differences to be too large. Or, uh, opposite ways, I don't want them to be too small, otherwise the problem is impossible. So I don't explain that, but you, you can, well, there are reasons to show that what I call non-trivial is when the distances between the means of order big O of 1 when p increases, and same thing for the traces, trace of the square, you can control those things. So I impose that. I impose that when things go large, my problem doesn't get too easy or too hard. This is with those assumptions. Okay. Now, here is what happens. According to spectral clustering, so I want to, to, to cluster those data in a non-supervised manner. So spectral clustering, what you do is you compute a certain uh, uh, affinity matrix between the data. So uh, here I call it K because it's going to be related to a kernel. So I, I compute this, kernel, this matrix K of size n by n with entry ij bet being the affinity between xi and xj. And what usually people do is that they take uh, this affinity function to be a certain function of the, the distance between xi and xj. So here the Euclidean distance. And f is going to be in general decreasing so that when the objects are close, uh, you have a strong affinity. When the objects are far, you have a weak affinity. So what you expect to have, and this is in the, the intuition from the first articles on, on, on this, uh, what you expect to have is that if the data are well uh, clustered already, so if I organize my matrix uh, according to classes, then on the, block, on the block diagonals, you expect to have a strong affinity. And on the half diagonal elements, you expect to have a low affinity. So what you should have is a matrix with almost zeros outside of the main diagonals and, and strong values here close to one, actually, if you take a decreasing exponential as everyone does, close to one on the main diagonal, so that, uh, I didn't show it here, so that the main eigenvectors of k will translate this information. And the main eigenvectors will be uh, vectors of zeros and ones uh, according to each of the classes, so that when you cluster your data using the eigenvectors, you recover the classes. This is the picture you, you want to get. Now I'll show you that in practice, this is not what you get at all. So here, here is what you get. Here I took two Gaussians, very simple setting, two Gaussians with mean plus mu or minus mu uh, and same covariance. And uh, the mu is whatever, uh, such that the mu1 minus mu2 is going to be big O of 1. I take a Gaussian kernel, like everyone would do. And on the left, what you see is, the, is what the kernel matrix, the affinity matrix looks like when p equals 4, so when the data are small dimension, and on the right when p equals 400. So what we anticipated from the previous slide 
is that you should get some picture like this, almost zeros of the diagonal and strong values on the diagonal, which is indeed what you get when p is small. When p is large, you don't get that behavior at all. When p is large, all the values in k are, are actually the same, almost the same. But, so, so it looks like spectral clustering is not going to work. Because if you have a picture like this, how can you cluster that? There is no information. Well, what I show you on the, on the right of k is the second eigenvector of matrix k. So here you indeed have a behavior with uh, uh, two different values for the eigenvector entries, depending on which class you're in. And on the right, surprisingly, you still have this behavior. So I told you that all the entries of k are asymptotically the same, apparently, but spectral clustering still works, which is quite surprising. Well, actually, this can be proved. It can be shown that that's actually very easy, that under my non-trivial growth condition, so when my problem doesn't get trivial, well, you can prove that the, the distance between xi and xj, no matter the class of i and j, tends to a constant tau, and that's, again, irrespective of the class. And that's the same constant for everyone, as long as uh, xi is different from xj. Okay, so you bringing those Gaussian mixture model, different means, different covariances possibly. If you are under my non-trivial growth rate setting, all the entries are going to convert to the same exact value. Okay, this is very counterintuitive because it looks like K, the affinity matrix, should be a, a, a matrix with all entries equal to F of tau, and that's it. So how do you cluster the data based on a matrix which has only the same entries? Well, it turns out that you need to look at things a bit more closely. Uh, and, and the idea is that, well, so, so the bad news is that the, 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 intu the classical intuition collapses. But the good news is that thanks to this convergence of the data, uh, thanks to the convergence of the, of the distance between the data, you can tailor expand the, the entries of your function. That is, here, this f of uh, this quantity is going to be almost equal to f of tau plus some residual terms. And what's going to happen is that the information is going to be captured inside those residual terms. Okay? And so it solves many problems at once because the, no, the fact that f is nonlinear is a problem, classically, to understand what are going to be the eigenvalues of this k matrix. No one knows. Uh, but when, when things get large, because of the Taylor expansion, things are going to be more s somehow linearized. And so we can predict things. But that, that's what I'm going to show you here. So you can linearize uh, using Taylor expansion. Well, it's more than linearizing. You, you need to Taylor expand to a few orders. And this is where the random matrix theory will, uh, will show its, its, its power. And so what we can prove, this is something we, we showed a few years back, uh, what you can actually prove is that this matrix K we were interested in is asymptotically close to another guy that I call K hat, meaning that all its eigenvalues and its dominant eigenvectors are going to be the same. Uh, and K hat is what? Is a spike model like the ones I've presented before. That is, it's a model with a, a, a noise matrix, so it's a bit more complicated than the one I presented, but it's essentially a noise matrix that has no structural information, plus a low rank perturbation. And this low rank perturbation has entries that are smaller in amplitude because it's in the Taylor expansion, but because of a, some sort of a collective effect, it has a norm, a, a, a spectral norm that is equivalent to the norm of the noise. Okay, random noise. Uh, with the same amplitude is not going to gather into a certain uh, eigen direction, but uh, weak signals all aligned to the same direction is going to pop up back and, and show some structure. And this is why things get comparable when you look matrix-wise. So entry-wise, you lose everything. Matrix-wise, there is uh, all the alignments of the planets that makes it that uh, you can compare noise and signal. Okay, that's really what happens. And so you have this structure, k, k is essentially equal to some noise part and a small perturbation. 
What is this perturbation? Well, it's a, it's a matrix of the type J, A, J transpose, which is of rank K. K being the number of classes. J is what? J are your clusters. J are the information. The, the J is a, is a matrix with uh, columns J1 to JK. And J A is a vector with zeros and ones. So that's what you want. If I give you J, you have the solution to your problem. But I don't have J. I have noise plus J A J transpose. So according to what I said at the beginning, uh, thanks to random matrix theory, we know there is a phase transition effect. A, a threshold beyond which there's going to be a positive alignment between the eigenvectors of this guy and the eigenvectors of this guy, which are what? Linear combination of your classes. So what you want to have as an information is retrieve those zeros and ones well, what you're going to have is noisy version of that. Noisy versions of that, if and only if you exceed a phase transition. Okay. And this phase transition, I told you before, is related to the fact that the eigenvalues of this guy also have to be uh, much larger than the ratio between the number of data and the size of the data. Okay. So what is, in, what, is in, uh, what, what is the power in this? It's inside this A matrix. And this is where it gets very interesting is that the A matrix captures the information about the distance between the means, the trace of the difference between the covariances, the trace of the difference between covariances square, which are exactly the object I, I, uh, I showed you before that I had to control, and most more importantly, functions of the kernel only at the point tau. So it's as if everything that happens to your data in terms of clustering is going to be linked to the first three derivatives of the function f in tau. So when, with, your, with the classical machine learning intuition in small dimension, you, you want to take a kernel that's going to be a decreasing exponential and you, you tune the sigma parameter to have uh, more or less classes, etc. Well, what I tell you is that when you go large dimensional, this intuition is not true anymore. What really happens is it only depends on what happens at tau and the derivative of f at tau. So if you take a decreasing exponential and a polynomial of order 2 having the same derivatives at tau, you have the same performance of spectral clustering, which is something we can see in simulations. Okay, so everything boils down to what happens in, at tau. Okay. Uh, Okay. And so since this is a spike model and I've shown you that I can characterize completely what's going to happen, I can predict the performances. Okay. I can predict accurately for any finite n and p, finite but large, what's going to be the performance of your spectral clustering for a given Gaussian mixture model. Okay. Which is nice because due to the nonlinearity in, in f, usually it's a difficult problem. Here I have the solution exactly. Um, Okay, but where it gets even nicer and, and very surprising at first is that all that is valid for Gaussian mixture models. Well, it turns out that it's surprisingly good, a, good, a surprisingly good fit to real data. So here, these are the eigenvalues you would get if you, do a, if you try to do a spectral clustering of MNIST with those three images. So here, the images of, of size 28 20 by 28, so that's a vector of size 784. When I take the data row, I don't pre-process them. And uh, I take 192 versions of those. So that's a 64 zeros, 64 ones, 64 twos. I do spectral clustering. I look at the eigenvectors, this is the, uh, the eigenvalues. This is what I have. Okay, so you have indeed a bunch of uh, noisy eigenvalues and, and a few ones that get outside. Now where it gets very interesting is that if I were to design a Gaussian mixture model having the same means and, and covariance as the zeros, ones, and twos, and I design my, uh, 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 a kernel matrix and I retrieve its eigenvalues, this is what I would get. So in white, those are the eigenvalues of a K matrix I would have obtained if instead of using MNIST data, I use Gaussian mixture models with the same means and covariances as the zeros, ones, and twos. 
Okay, and you see that the eigenvalues are very closely matching, okay, less and less as you go down, but the first ones are, are accurate matches for, for those of the real data. But it's even better when you look at the, eigenve uh, the eigenvectors. So these are the first four eigenvectors of the MNIST spectral clustering. Uh, as you see, there is information. You see the, the noisy plateaus. And so in red, this is what you have in real, and in blue, this is what you would get if, thanks to the theory that I developed. So thanks to the, so uh, under the assumption that everything is Gaussian with the same means and covariances. So what you see, the, the, strong, the, the dark blue line is not the average of the red one. It's what you would get with the theory. And so again, it's a perfect match. If you go in two dimensions, so if you look like at uh, eigenvector one versus eigenvector two, or eigenvector two versus eigenvector three. This is the, the cloud of points you would get. And this is what the theory will tell you if you were Gaussian. So again, it fits pretty well, okay, which at first is very surprising. But we will see uh, if I have time uh, at the end of the talk that this is no longer surprising now. Uh, so that's one thing. So we understand now how we're using randometrics theory, how r some algorithms behave when you go large dimensional and why they tend to behave very differently. Here I'm going to show you an example, a very nice example where of an algorithm that doesn't work usually, that, that tend to actually collapse when you go large dimensional and that we can now uh, reassess and, and improve using randometrics theory. So, um, uh, okay, I'll skip this one. Uh, well, okay, no, maybe I'm not going to skip it, uh, just because we, we stick on, on kernels. Uh, so I told you that the information about the kernel is, is inside f prime of tau, f second of tau, and we have an explicit formula for how things behave. And it turns out that we can prove that the best kernel you should take if the discriminative information in your data is only based on covariances, that is the means have no information in, in each class. Only the covariance structure has an information. Then there's a, some kind of an extra phase transition that occurs in that case that makes it that the Gaussian kernel is a very, very bad choice. However, the best choice you can make is a polynomial of order two of this type. So this tau parameter, which is the, the, the limiting distance between all of the points, you can estimate it. And so you can design a kernel of the type t minus tau square, and this one we know has an extremely good performance in terms of comparing data with different covariances. So here I give you an example. These are, uh, this is a Gaussian mixture of two uh, data, either Gaussian with zero mean covariance C1 or Gaussian with zero mean covariance C2. This is what the uh, Gaussian mixture, the Gaussian kernel would do, so it doesn't work. And this is what the t minus tau square kernel would do. Uh, okay, it works. And uh, we, tr we played with that on real data. So here these are EEG data set that have, uh, so it's between uh, um, uh, uh, sick or sane people. Uh, and, and essentially the information is not in the mean, it's in the structural covariance. Well, same thing here. If you use a Gaussian kernel, you start to discriminate data, but not too, not too well. If you go with this t minus tau square, there's a, a, a large discrimination. Okay, so that's something you can understand. And by the way, this is not a positive definite kernel. So all, all this uh, uh, HK, uh, uh, RKHS theory doesn't work for us. Anyway, so that's, that was one example. So um, the one I wanted to focus on is this uh, semi-supervised learning method. Semi-supervised learning is, uh, well, to me, is something is, is, is something we should focus more on. It's the case where you have a certain, among the data you collected, a certain number of them are labeled, but only few of them. So here I have, same setting as before, I have NA data from class A, but a few, part of them are labeled with, ma with this L, and a, lo a majority of them are unlabeled. And the point is to gather all of those data together, and in in a semi-supervised manner, try to recover the classes for everyone. Okay, so it's different from uh, supervised learning because you don't treat the unlabeled data one by one, you treat them collectively. So you use both the unsupervised and the supervised aspects of the theory. The way people usually uh, work this problem out 
Uh, actually, there, there are different ways. There are, there's a graph-based approach. There is this optimization approach, but they tend to be equivalent. So, um, so the way to, to work this out is to say that you want to, to uh, allocate scores to each of the data. So I will allocate scores FIA for data XI to belong to class A. Okay? And so you, for every data, you have a score FI1, FI2, FI, up to FIK. You collect those scores, you compare the scores, and you allocate the class to the, the highest score. So one way of finding this F uh, in a simple manner is to minimize a cost function, which would be like this. The sum of the affinity between I and J times the difference between FIA and, okay, and, the, uh, and FJA. Sorry, that's not a B, that's an A. So the idea being that, uh, so you minimize this and you, you allocate for the label data, uh, those that you all, for which you already know the labels, you allocate one or zero. One if you belong to the, to the class and zero otherwise. The idea of this is that if Kij is a has a strong value, so if A, I, and J have a strong affinity, uh, then if you want to minimize this cost, you have to make this guy close to zero. So you want to allocate the same score for FIA and, and FJA. Okay, opposite ways, if I and J are very different, then Kij is very small. So you can tolerate that this quantity is not too close to zero. And you can change the label, essentially. Okay, so that, that's the idea. This problem is nice because it's uh, quadratic under linear constraint. Uh, and so you have an explicit solution. So what it tells you is that the scores for the unlabeled data should be a function of the scores for the labeled data through a given uh, kernel here that depends on, on the K matrix. Okay. Well, it turns out that, and it's been, uh, it's been shown repeatedly, that this method doesn't work so well on, on real data. Yeah, I'll show you why. So what you expect, okay, based on what I've said, what you would expect is something like this. When you look at the scores to belong to class one for all of the data, Say I split the data in class 1, 2, 3, the, the, the genuine classes, and I subdivide into labeled and unlabeled. Then for those guys that truly belong to class 1 and that are labeled, I associate a score to 1. And otherwise, I associate a score 0. Okay. And so what I expect is that the guys that are very close to my labeled data but because they belong to the same class, should have a score that will be very close to 1 when I solve the optimization problem. Okay? Otherwise, the scores will be close to 0. That's what I expect to see. Same thing for class 2. Uh, high scores for the guys that belong to class 2 and low scores for the others. Same thing for class 3. And the probability of error will be whenever there's a crossing here. Okay? Because at the end of the day, I compare the scores for, uh, of this guy versus this guy and this guy, and the, the winner is the highest one. Okay. That's what you expect to see. Well, here's what you see in practice. So on the left, if you look at the left part, this is the same picture, but for real data. So here the scores are indeed at 1 and 0 for the labeled uh, data, but then the rest is, is all a big mess of all almost equal scores. So if you see, Every uh, blue circle is a score for belonging to class 1, and every red cross is a score to belong to class 2. So it's almost identical for every pair of data. So it doesn't work. Well, actually, it works. Because if you zoom in, you indeed have a few very, very small difference. Uh, if you look at the axis, it's up to the 10 to the minus 3. So there is a small difference in between the so when I compare the distance between each point, and so you can do classification. But it doesn't work at all the way we predicted, because as you see, those ones are actually not playing any role in, in uh, attracting the blue guys, and those zeros are not attracting the red guys. So, so it's really not working the way we want. But it still works, okay, apparently. Well, what we proved is that indeed, uh, so, so this is for uh, Gaussian data. If you look at the same thing for MNIST, well, you have the same night nightmarish uh, behavior where there's no, no actual difference. But if you look uh, one by one, you have a small delta in between the, the, the values. And it's always uh, consistent 
Like here, all the red crosses are on top. Here, most of the blue guys are on top. And same thing for the, for the green rectangles. So it still works, but, but again, not as we predict, uh, as we would anticipate, at least. So um, using random matrix theory, okay, I'll, I'll move uh, on that. Using random matrix theory, uh, we can show exactly what happens. And so uh, that's because we can understand this kernel matrix K. We have its development. We know this uh, spike model, et cetera, all the statistics. And we can prove exactly that the score for Xi to belong to class 1 or 2 or 3 or 5, okay, this vector of size K for each of the data, tends to a Gaussian vector with predictable means and covariances. And these predictable means and covariances are again function of the statistics of the data and of the derivatives of f in tau. Okay. But one thing we realize is that those statistics, those limiting mb and, and uh, sigma b, so the statistics of the scores of the data, do not depend on the number of unlabeled data. So we observed, and that was a bit uh, surprising at first, that even if you double the number of unlabeled data, your algorithm is not going to perform better. It's indifferent from the number of unlabeled data. So it's working as if it was completely supervised. So we thought that there was a mistake. But actually, it's referenced in, in, uh, in, 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 in the literature. So here, this is uh, uh, in chapter 4 of the book, uh, Semi-Supervised Learning, where they say that it is frequently the case that we would be better off just <coughs> discarding the unlabeled data and using a supervised method rather than taking the semi-supervised route. Okay, so thus we worry about the embarrassing situation where the addition of unlabeled data actually degrades the performance. So what we see is that it stabilizes the performance. It's irrelevant. What they see apparently in practice is that it's even, it can even be worse to add more and more unlabeled data, which is very bizarre. It should not behave like this. And actually, this is something, again, that using random matrix theory, you can understand. You can understand it, and you can see that the, the culprit is actually the choice of your kernel matrix K. You should not use K, because K has a strong bias, and it ruins the effect of the unlabeled data. When you do the math, you realize that you would be better off projecting K left and right over the orthogonal to the vector of ones, because this is, this is the guy that creates a bias. If you do this, you recover the correct behavior. And so the surprising thing when we saw this is that we figured someone must have seen that before. But actually, it's quite counterintuitive to use this kernel, because k tilde, as opposed to k, has the bad property, apparently bad property, to have negative entries. Necessarily, it has negative entries because the sum of the rows has to be zero. And so, from a finite dimensional intuition, from this intuition I, I mentioned at the very beginning, you don't want this to be negative because the optimization problem will have a solution, which is uh, uh, having minus infinity or infinity for all of the scores. Okay, so you want, in, in order to optimize this, uh, to, for this problem to remain convex, uh, you want Kij to be positive. Well, it turns out that this is not needed when you go large dimensional, and so up to a given regularization constraint, it's, you're better off changing K for a projected version of K. And that avoids the problem of, uh, of this uh, strong bias that, that makes the, the whole algorithm collapse. And so when you, do the, when you do this improvement, when you change K for K tilde, now you have a performance, which is the red one, in terms of uh, uh, classification rate, which is better than the, the standard approach. So the standard approach is the one with k that doesn't improve in performance even if you increase the number of unlabeled data. That's what we observe. So here, the, the corrected version improves in performance. And, and this was the, the frustrating thing that I mentioned before uh, in the <coughs> previous slide. Spectral clustering was even getting better than uh, semi-supervised learning at some point. So here we, we are on top of both. Okay. So that, that's, I think, qu quite a telling example of what happens in large dimension 
and, and, and why it happens very differently and how we can recover it. And the last thing I want, and okay, so, so in, in terms of uh, applications, uh, everything that's in red here is the uh, random matrix theory improved version of the, of the kernel matrix. And you see that in terms of recovery for real data, you improve things significantly. So that's for MNIST, that's for uh, another set of, uh, of data. Uh, and, and systematically, the RMT version is, is better than the rest. Okay, and so the last thing I wanted to talk about is that uh, I, okay, in two minutes then, the last thing I want to talk about is the fact that uh, everything that I've shown is theoretically for Gaussian mixture models. Why does it work on real data? And it turns out that recently we figured out, okay, I'll, I'll have to move quickly, that all our theory is valid not only for Gaussian mixtures, but for a much more general class of data which are so-called concentrated random vectors. So the idea is that a concentrated random vector is a vector such that if you do a, a, a Lipschitz observation of it, a scalar Lipschitz observation of it, it's predictable. Okay? So for every Lipschitz map from the, from the data to R, the probability to move away from the expectation is something that decreases. So you have a concentration inequality for this. The interesting thing about Gaussian, uh, about concentrated random vectors is that they are, um, uh, they are stable under Lipschitz transformations. And what we could show is that for those concentrated random vectors, everything I've said so far is still valid. Right? So why is it important? It is important because we know of concrete examples of real, almost real data that are concentrated random vectors, which is the example given by GANs. So GANs generated avatarial networks are those uh, machines, those neural networks that produce fake images, trying to mimic real images. And how do they do this? They do this starting with a Gaussian uh, noise vector. They, they start with a Gaussian noise vector and that goes through a, um, a neural network that is just a combination of linear operations and Lipschitz uh, operations. And so this is a Lipschitz, at the end of, uh, of the, uh, the exit here, uh, those stack images happen to be concentrated random vectors. And if you extract features from them through a CNN, same thing, you're going to get, oh, so this is not this picture, if you take those fake images and you use a convention, convolutional neural network to extract features, same thing, you have concentrated random vector. So all the theory I mentioned so far is valid for Gaussian mixture models, but also for those fake images. And since those fake images are almost real images, that means that everything I've said is valid for those real images. Okay. Uh, and this is why you see that, and so this is, this is what you have with, your, with the GAN. Uh, so uh, what I did here is I, uh, I took images created from GANs and I extracted the features through a CNN and I do spectral clustering on them. Okay. And in, uh, what you have in purple is the actual eigenvectors and the actual eigenvalues. What you have in black is my random matrix prediction and it's a perfect fit. But that we know because that's theory. And now if you try with real images, well, same story, it fits perfectly. And that's, uh, but now we can believe it. It's not just uh, artificial. Okay, I'm, I'm stopping here because I'm too late. Thank you. Okay, so we have time only for one question and the other questions will be at the break. One question. Thank you for a very nice talk. Um, so several times you mentioned that um, the results that you obtain are under specific growth conditions. Uh, and so if I understand well, uh, there are regimes that are like, you know, below that growth, con I mean like if the growth mm -hmm. condition is, is, yes. is different, like above and below. Yeah. So could you comment a bit on what happened, I mean like what is the size of this range where this happens and what happens below and and beyond. Yeah, so, so, below, so beyond means that what's going to happen is that your eigenvalues are going to be, so 
So the, the informative eigenvalues in that case, uh, let me get to one of those pictures, uh, like here. The, if you are beyond this regime, this eigenvalue will gonna, is going to go so far on the right that the corresponding eigenvectors will be all clean and, and these things are too easy. And below the threshold, asymptotically, you can prove you have no recovery possible. So you're going to see only pure noise, theoretically at least. I and ask what, is, what, is the, what are these scalings? What are these scalings? Uh, oh, the, oh, the gross condition is that, okay, so N and P must be of the same order of magnitude and everything else is controlled through by the ratio N and P. So the distance between two, if, if N and P were to change, uh, if one is, is increasing with respect to the other, that means you can recover closer and closer classes. Uh, the, so, so there is a comparison between the distance between the statistics of the class and this ratio P and N. And so we can compare them exactly. We, we have the th theoretical exp uh, expressions, but I didn't want to show them here. They are related. Mm. Okay, so thank you very much. We, we'll move to our next speaker to keep in time with the schedule. But at the coffee break, of course, you can ask Roma all of your questions. <laughs>